I've gotten a lot of questions about the chloride shift. Uh, why is it necessary? What happens if it doesn't happen? And so we are going to, well, I'm going to um, just draw a little sketch of why we need it and what would happen if we did not have it. So here's some tissue. And here's a capillary that's running right next to that tissue. Inside this capillary, we've got red blood cells. And the partial pressure of CO2 in this capillary is about 40 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of CO2 in the tissue or in the interstitial fluid is about 45 millimeters of mercury. So since we have this difference in the partial pressures of CO2, it's higher in the interstitial fluid than it is in the capillary, CO2 will diffuse from the tissue into the capillary. Now we had three different ways that CO2 could be transported in the blood. A little bit of that CO2 gets transported as just plain dissolved CO2. So there's nothing that changes. So about 7% of it is just dissolved CO2. And about 23% of it gets transported as carbaminohemoglobin. So that just bind, binds to the peptide part, to the alpha and beta chains of the hemoglobin. Nothing chemically changes to the hemoglobin. The other 70% of it is what we care about right now. And that's the part that gets carried around as bicarbonate, or HCO3 minus. In order to transport the majority of our hemoglobin, we first need to chemically convert it into bicarbonate. So the way this happens is CO2 gets together with some water, and it gets converted into carbonic acid. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called carbonic anhydrase. The most important thing to remember right now is this reaction right here is happening inside of a red blood cell, okay? The enzyme carbonic anhydrase is inside that red blood cell. And so it doesn't just, the CO2 doesn't just come into the capillary and undergo this conversion. That CO2 has got to come into the red blood cell in order to be converted into carbonic acid. That carbonic acid then will immediately break down into the bar bicarbonate ion and a proton. So I'm going to rewrite this equation as CO2 plus water is in equilibrium with bicarbonate and a proton. This proton goes and binds to hemoglobin. And that's why the intracellular pH of a red blood cell doesn't drop way down as you make this um, hydrogen ion. The bicarb then exits, so let's draw a big red blood cell around this, and we're going to take the bicarb. Bicarb's going to leave the cell, and a chloride ion will come in to balance the charge, right? So if we have a negative ion leaving, we need to have a negative ion entering the cell in order to keep the net electrical charge of that cell the same. The chlor We didn't talk about this in class, but somebody asked at the review session yesterday, what would happen if the chloride shift didn't happen? So if bicarb didn't leave and chloride didn't enter, we would have a physiological problem. And here is why. Think way back to chemistry. If we have a reaction that can go either way, if we take one of these um, compounds away, we can now make more of it. Okay? So as 
bicarb is leaving the cell that helps us to convert more CO2 into bicarbonate. So as bicarb drops, we can make more bicarb. If this did not happen, if the chloride shift went away and bicarb just kept building up, then eventually we would stop being able to convert CO2 into bicarb. We wouldn't be able to transport it in the blood, and now that CO2 would build up here in the tissue. So that's why the chloride shift is important, because we've got to get bicarb out of that red blood cell in order to continue to convert CO2 into bicarb.